Welcome to the Digital Planning Podcast. This series is designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. To keep up with all things digital, please subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. And now, Jennifer Ziegel, a partner at Kleinbart LLC, Ross Bruck, a principal of Estate Genie, and Justin Brown, a partner at Pepper Hamilton LLP, with today's topic. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Digital Planning Podcast. I'm your host, Ross, along with my co-hosts, Jen and Justin. Today, we are joined by a guest, Lee Poskander, who is the CEO of Directive Communication Systems, or DCS. The topic for discussion today is going to be a state administration with digital assets. And this is a topic we've covered before and and explored. Um, Today, we're going to focus a little bit more on discussions related to fiduciary access to those digital assets and some of the problems and solutions that are out there in the marketplace today. So Lee, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. If you could give a quick little background on yourself and and your bio. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I'm excited to talk about digital property and and how this industry and environment is changing quickly. I got into the business in kind of a backwards fashion. Uh, I had been working uh, with a friend of mine who passed away very suddenly back in 2013 and about three months later uh, went on to LinkedIn and there was his profile and it wanted me to congratulate him on being a volunteer ski instructor, ski instructor up in Maine uh, for, on his 20th anniversary. And I just thought about calling Jim and saying hi, and then I remembered Jim was no longer with us. But I imagined that most people who didn't know he was dead would be calling him, and his 10-year-old daughter would pick up the phone and go, Daddy's dead. And so I started doing a little bit of investigation, started meeting with attorneys and wealth managers and accountants, and discovered that nobody's really handling digital property, particularly on the social media side. But what I learned quickly is that Unfortunately, their clients are losing financial matter. Bank accounts are going lost. Investment portfolios are not being found. And even investments in virtual gaming or in domain names are causing financial loss. So not only do we have a sentimental loss, but we're having a financial loss. At the same time, uh, the Uniform Law Commission was coming up with the Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act, the first version and come to find out that there's looking at government regulation around digital property that most legal advisors or wealth managers weren't even aware of. And so uh, started looking at the opportunity, what can be done, what solutions are available, and there's not much in the marketplace, and so I decided to create Directive Communication Systems. Uh, The system that we've built um, was based on input directly from AOL, Google, and Facebook. And it's important to note that they are big influencers on the industry. Uh, They really have a foothold on what's going to happen to digital property and other website owners and app manufacturers are looking to them as leaders and guidance. And so they've been instrumental along with the Uniform Law Commission Uh, as to what will happen with digital property when someone passes away. And so that's a little bit of the background on on how I got into the industry and and where uh, we've been coming or where we've been for the last five years. So as a quick background and a refresher to our audience, we've covered the Uniform Act, currently RUFADA. Some of us say RUFADA, some of us some are you FADA. We'll we'll talk about that later. Uh, But we've covered the RUFADA issue before, look back to some of our previous episodes for for a more detailed review of that. But Jen and Justin, as a quick background, just to to bring everybody up to speed, I think of RUFADA as a hierarchy of of tools to employ in in looking to uh, administer an estate with digital assets. Anybody want to expand on that? Yeah, I think RUFADA is designed primarily for Uh, fiduciary access to digital assets. So the hierarchy is to how does a fiduciary access a a decedent's or an individual's uh, uh, digital assets. So first in the hierarchy is the online tool. 
Um, so we've talked a number of times about how uh, uh, service providers or websites can create an online tool that can uh, be used to maybe designate an individual who can access the digital asset after a decedent's death. Um, in the absence of an online tool, the next place that we would look to is the terms of an individual's will. So if the individual's will provides lawful consent for the executor to access the digital assets, um, then, the, then the executor would be able to access the assets. And in the absence of an online tool or any lawful consent in a will, um, the, the third provision, the third the, the default would be looking to the terms of service agreement of the uh, service provider. Or the the internet company. So um, at that point, you're really stuck with whatever the terms of service agreement say says. Um, so to me, that's that's the that's the hierarchy of of how a, a, an executor or fiduciary can access a, an individual's uh, digital assets. So speaking of terms of service, I, I, let's start there, Lee. Eventually, I want to get into how DCS fits into that hierarchy. But you mentioned something in your in your introduction about the the tech companies being big influencers in this area. And one thing that we've talked about before on this show is that it seems when we read terms of service agreements, like these tech companies aren't thinking about probate, aren't thinking about the death of their their clients, their customers at all, because it seems like an afterthought. And how does that? merge with the idea that they are actually big influencers. Well, if you think about it, technology is relatively new. You know, it was only what two and a half decades ago that we really started using email and that we started conducting our lives online. And most of that innovation was done by kids in their 20s or or maybe even younger. If you think about Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, he was in a garage and it was just after college that he created this. Our innovators of today and in the past never really thought about an account holder's death. They were excited about the products they were delivering, whether it's video streaming services, email, uh, e-commerce. They just never, they never considered what would happen when an account holder passes away. And so if we take a moment and think about it, it's not because they don't want to. It's simply because they just never considered it. And they're not doing, uh, they're not really looking at account holder death as a priority because they really haven't had a large amount of clients pass away. Uh, But it is expected that in the next few years that Facebook will actually have more dead people on uh, on their program than they will have live. Uh, so we have innovators who've never really considered account holder death. Now they're forced to considering it. And when you have uh, uh, Goliaths like Google and Facebook and AOL that have no choice because they have so many subscribers and they have people dying, they have to approach it with something. And it is, if, you, if you've been on a corporate's uh, internal culture, if you've been inside their, their company, their priorities are revenue, product, security, privacy. It's not what's going to happen when the account holder passes away. Now they have to take a look at it. That are you FEDA, as I call it, uh, really compels them to focus in on this. But we're still going to have young innovators who are coming out of college, coming up with the latest community, the latest gadget, the latest service and they're going to be thinking about that service and not necessarily the account holder death so we're going to be seeing this problem persist but i do want to bring up uh something justin that that as the ru fate of uh, high priority is the online tool these tools that are created that v- very few do exist but the ones that do they're not necessarily great for the estate in fact they can be counterproductive uh, so for the, the Google Inactive Account Manager, while it allows someone to, to state after a certain period of time where there's no activity, please contact this individual, and if they don't respond or, or they say I'm dead, you, you're going to pass the content on to them, what ends up happening is that time has passed. That person may no longer realize that they have it that responsibility. They may not know the person's passed away, but more importantly, Google doesn't necessarily disclose who that person is because that's private matter as well. 
So the estate may be trying to figure out who's got the contents of the email, the documents, or the hangouts. And Google may say, well, we've passed it on to somebody. Well, now the estate's got to play detective to figure out who that is. And another problem you have is if the, if the phone, the decedent's phone is accessed and it's going out to the Google account, that's resetting the, the, the clock, so to speak, for the inactivity. Absolutely. And so it will live on in perpetuity if there's an automatic activity taking place. So you have situations where those site owners have not fully prepared for an estate's purposes. Another big issue with Google, which I understand they're changing and, and we've been in contact about, uh, about this with them, is that you have to designate somebody who has Gmail and it has to be an individual. So you can't say, I want it to go to my estate through the inactive account manager. You can't quickly change fiduciaries unless you log in, make the changes and come back. And if you need to do that for several sites, chances are you're going to probably procrastinate and not do it because you have so many other sites to do. And I will just say also Facebooks, they have a digital legacy content manager and that's great for memorialization. But does that really get you the disclosure of, disclosure of information that you need? It doesn't really help there in terms of instant messages or other communications that may, you may want access to. Uh, I will, the one other thing I will say about the RU FEDA, uh, for everybody, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it grants you the disclosure of the account contents. It doesn't have you go in and impersonate the account holder. And you cannot conduct activity as if you are that person. So it will get you the information and the data for the estate, but it will all be data dumped into some form of drive or, or cloud-based storage. And somebody's still gonna have to go through it all to f identify pictures, financial matter, intellectual property, uh, all the other things that come with it. So it's while the, the RU FEDA law creates a path, um, it's not perfect, but it is a very good first step. And I think you, you're right there, you're showing the intersection between, uh, I call it RUFADA, and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, where mm -hmm. if somebody's coming in and impersonating, um, that's a violation of the Computer Fraud, either state or uh, federal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of really describing the competing interests for service providers that want to utilize online tools and users who want to utilize online tools and also estate planning documents and where there are a lot of competing tensions if the fiduciaries named in the estate planning documents are different than the person who's designated uh, in the online tool. And I think we're going to see a lot of litigation uh, as people pass who have utilized those types of options in terms of trying to compel information. Because what might be listed in an email account uh, might not necessarily be a digital asset, but it could have information that would unlock where a digital asset might be located mm -hmm. that is properly owned by the estate. Mm -hmm. well, I've come across a scenario, uh, and I hope I get this right, where the device was designated for one person, but the encryption for blockchain, because it's not hardware, which resides on the device, is for somebody else. So who actually has the encryption code? Does the person with the hardware technically become the beneficiary of the encryption code to unlock the cryptocurrency. And th that's, that opens up a Pandora's box because it resides on the hardware. It's been granted to somebody else who doesn't have the rights to the hardware. Yes, and I think as a, to the estate planning community, it's really important in planning documents to really specify ownership and access rights to those types of devices and uh, information and clearly spell out who would have first priority to clear a device or wipe a device of information and data before then it's transferred to the uh, recipient of the device. And we as planners need to know that. We as planners need to know that there is this conflict with the ownership of the device and the ownership of the information mm -hmm. on the device. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where some attorneys with with the good intent and the right intent have created digital executors, but we're starting to see them fail because those overarching, general, very general statements of assignment don't actually execute the job. 
uh, because one, they're ambiguous. Two, it leaves the assumption up to the executor or the trustee. And what ends up happening is there can be conflict between hardware and software in that instance, because which is technically the digital product. But you also now don't have, you don't have necessarily user names or email addresses that are associated with the account. Uh, I was just at a panel down in Florida for the Bankers Association where it was discussed of, well, we just put in this digital executor uh, and let's say it's, they have the ability to then manage Facebook. And I asked them, well, what do you do if their name is Bob Jones and you don't have the email address that's associated with Facebook? Well, Facebook will handle that. Well, no, there could be 25 Bob Jones in Naples, Florida, and how does Facebook know which one is that specific account holder? And so if you try to overgeneralize, you end up with more problems because then the site owners can say, well, wait a minute, you don't have the right information. We can't release information to you. We can't do the data. And because you don't, or you probably won't get it, we can permanently lock you out. Mm -hmm. And so there's real ramifications for not being fully prepared. It's not as simple as the old days where you knew that the bank account existed at Bank of America. You just had to fill out the paperwork and get it right, follow the right processes. Now, in this instance, with digital property, for the first time, the custodians actually have authority. They have governance because over the private matters and the private data because they have liabilities if it gets into the wrong hands. And that's something that I don't think we as an industry have seen before. Well, I would say I think we have seen it in a little bit of a different capacity in terms of estate plans that go awry because beneficiary designations weren't properly updated and the proper beneficiaries weren't named or didn't go to um, the designated recipient because the beneficiary designation was never properly updated. And I think online tools are akin to beneficiary designations in essentially non-probate transfers. So the same issues in that arise when beneficiary designations aren't updated properly when someone's updating their estate planning documents are the exact same scenario with online tools. Okay. I, I think it's going to become a bigger and bigger issue and it's going to become more and more costly. And again, in the sense of physical assets like bank accounts, investment portfolios, for the first time ever, you can actually see money evaporate. It can literally disappear. If you've got a domain name that's worth a million dollars, let's say, and we have uh, a number of people that I know that have that, and that domain name subscription expires and it doesn't get renewed, well, that family's out of seven-figure inheritance. And somebody for $3 or $9 on GoDaddy.com is going to be able to buy it and have a windfall overnight simply because nobody knew the account existed, nobody continued the re subscription, and time is not of, you know, it's not going to turn it over as abandoned property to be sheeted to the estate and then found out later. It's going to evaporate. Same thing with virtual artifacts in a game. Somebody spends $50,000 on a virtual sword that's got superpowers that I would never do uh, or have, but their younger people do. Now I just gave a little hint to my age. Um, but that can, if that game is not known by the estate, let alone the virtual sword within that game, it's going to literally disappear and it will never be returned. Uh, and this is going to happen more and more. Uh, this doesn't just ne necessarily have to happen with financial matter. Uh, I know of a, an elderly gentleman who has 12 websites that are all designed around World War II artifacts, memorabilia, and historical and for historical purposes. And the State University of New York uses these sites as part of their educational programs. So not only if, he, if those domain names disappear, is it a financial matter, but you're talking about actually losing our history, our American legacy, and the ability to educate young people just simply because a domain name doesn't get renewed. So I think we're all in agreement that solving the digital property problem is something that as estate planners, we're going to continuously have to monitor and track and see how others are solving the problem. And there's 
many attempts at, at doing so, but can we hear about how DCS is trying to tackle this issue, and in particular, <laughs> how that fits into the Rufata hierarchy? Sure. So directive communications uh, was, as I said before, designed with input from the website owners. It's critical to get their buy-in because without knowing what their criteria is for releasing financial matter or any data, actually, any of the data that they hold on to, we would be remiss in just making assumptions and speculating what will work or not. So our platform was designed with input directly from custodians. We also went to wealth managers and lawyers and got their input. What do they need? What do they need to see? What declarations need to be made? How is it to be handled? So we created a platform that's usable by advisors and their clients in registering the accounts, so we're keeping them visible, and then also their directives, and there are two types of directives everybody should be aware of. One is the informational or data disclosure directive, which is I want to designate the information to the estate, an individual, whatever it may be, but also the action-oriented directive is just as important. What do you want to do with the account after data has been disclosed? Do you want to close the account? Do you want to remove your name from the family share plan? Do you want to transfer the account? Do you want to memorialize the account? So we, ha we built the system to recognize both types of directives. We also knew that this is an area that is very sensitive to people. Talking about their death is taboo. I'm sure every one of us can tell us about clients that have taken forever to get their estate documents done. Probably there are probably some that have been working on them for two years, still haven't gotten them signed. I have one seven years out. Seven years, <laughs> been still working on it. So we know that people don't want to face their own demise. So what we've done is taken the hardship out of it. And we've, we've provided three ways of uploading accounts. You can do it manually if you want, but we also feature a data document upload called uh, Portfolio Link, where if you send us a spreadsheet, a Word document, uh, even a handwritten scan of your URL with your username and uh, on financial accounts, the account number. But we do not take passwords. We will reject anything that comes through with passwords. If you send that to us, we will populate the information for you. So you're just really clicking a button. Then, as we look to the future, because we don't know what accounts we're going to be enrolling in, we don't know what those terms of service are going to be, but we do know it's going to be based, anything that happens is going to be based on account holder intent. We've created a browser extension so that as you enroll in new accounts, we'll capture the URL, we'll capture your username, and we'll ask you right then and there, do you want to add this to your portfolio of accounts? Or you can say, no, I don't want to. By doing this in this manner, we're, we have the data, we have the logs, we have all the information necessary to prove to the custodian this is the decision this account holder wanted to make. And it is part of their trust. It is part of their estate and they were able to go back to those custodians and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this is what the client wanted to do. We also handle devices, so we gather the information regarding the hardware, so your phone, your tablet, your computer, and we can assist in making sure that files are kept visible there. And then uh, we provide videos uh, that are educational for both the clients and the advisors, so it's very easy for them to use. And what we've been told is it's very intuitive, very easy, even for those in their 80s or 90s to use. We have very few customer service calls in terms of wanting to know how does it work or how do I do this or I'm confused. And then at the time of the estate's administration or the, the settlement, DCS handles and carries out the directives to the site owners. We know their protocols, we know their process, we know the data, the, the, the documentation required. So we're able to provide them, based on their terms of service, what they need to do, what they need in order to conduct the service uh, and data disclosure uh, that the estate's looking for. So let's dive in there for just one second. You are in direct communication with those custodians, those providers? Correct. So we handle that customer service for you or for the estate so that they're not running around playing account manager. They're not trying to figure out, oh boy, I've got to call Facebook again and get this settled or I need to reach out to Adobe. Uh, so we are 
we handle all of that because we know the processes. We streamline that laborious effort and we make it easy. Let's jump back to your comment about passwords. DCS doesn't store passwords. I've been reading for years that the death of the password is just around the corner, that some of the big players, the Microsofts, the Googles, are eventually going to move towards a more biometric type password, just eliminate passwords altogether, some other solution that I haven't even contemplated yet. Where do you see, from, from your knowledge, and, 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 and I'm not sure if the motivation for DCS to avoid passwords is more of a liability or because of the cumbersome nature of passwords and the, and the problems it creates, but where do you see that headed? I'm, I'm going to tackle that question in, in a couple different ways. Uh, first, by the terms of service and the policies that most custodians, they prohibit the use of passwords. So it's not even an option when handling an estate's administration or the settlement. Uh, so we don't take passwords because it's a security risk, but most importantly, it's not, it's not, not only required, it's prohibited for us to use them. So we avoid them at all costs, and, and quite frankly, that's to the account holder's benefit. Uh, this way, DCS does not have access to the accounts itself, nor to the contents of the accounts. We only have know the accounts exist and what's to be done with it. In terms of the overall perspective on passwords, we are seeing that that new evolution, evolutionary step in uh, password management. Uh, you've got Apple who uses facial recognition now with their, their cell phones, beginning with uh, 10. Uh, I personally have Citibank charge card that does voice recognition when I call in. I no longer have to validate my card. They get to, they get to hear this raspy voice and say, that's Lee Pos cancer. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, uh, but we do recognize that this technology is coming. We do, we do have organizations on, or features on our browser extensions and our devices that no longer require us to input passwords. It just remembers we're signed in. So we see that passwords are becoming obsolete. And we do know that, particularly with hardware, the password is also going away and we're seeing retina scans, fingerprint IDs, uh, facial scan and I'm sure there's going to be more coming uh, and so the the idea of a password uh, and and sharing it is is risky and I and I say that only because if I'm a custodian if I'm and I, I hate to pick on Google again here but if I see someone attempting to use an outdated password to log in my assumption is it's not an estate trying to get content my assumptions, it's hacking. And if it's happening several times, yeah, I may start looking at authorities coming in and saying, do we have a cell? Cyber criminals hap happening? Do we see, do we, do we need to get police involved? Um, and that's, that can open up a lot of risks too. Real quick question on that. So do you have somebody actively monitoring these types of accounts or do you have AI technology that if there are multiple attempts at a old password that you get notification or the company gets notification? How does that work? No, we because that's really stays within the realm of the custodian and their security policies and because we don't touch passwords, we're not involved in that process at all. So we wouldn't know if somebody was attempting to hack okay. into that account with passwords. Now that is something we're looking to uh, in the in the short term that we may be able to help with uh, uh, but right now it, it's something that we we are just looking at okay I misunderstood you when I thought you said you would potentially contact the authorities but you were referring to the a generic generic service yes. provider yes okay. um, I apologize no problem have you come across a situation where you have a user who is is employing your services and has gone through uh, the procedures of designating what they want to happen with various accounts, then that person passes only to find out that they might have utilized an online tool either before or after your services were engaged and, and what the service provider, how they handled it? Yeah, uh, we have not come across that conflict. Uh, believe it or not, the Google Inactive Account Manager I believe uh, worldwide has only 3 million users. 
So if you break it down into a realistic spec, uh, spectrum, very few people are actually taking advantage of it. So we don't really have that conflict occurring as of today. I think the bigger issue at hand right now is education of people so that uh, that they know what is going to happen, whether it's next week, next month, next year, or 10 years from now. It's about their privacy and it's about what they want to release and what they want to do. Uh, and then I think secondarily, it's getting the accounts visible so that people can take action on them. That's half the problem is accounts are not visible. If, if nobody knows that game exists, or even in the case of financial matter, um, if nobody knows that 401k uh, that somebody had for many years where the statements are being sent to an email address that nobody knows exists, that's going to be looked over and passed over. And I think that's where some of the, the more immediate needs are. And I think as custodians develop their online tools, we'll see more of that conflict. Uh, and I think that's, that, that'll be a couple years down the road. Uh, and our, us as a company are looking to help website owners with that service so we can minimize conflict, we can minimize uh, issues where there are two different statements. Interesting. No, I completely agree that if digital assets aren't disclosed, they could uh, never be located, especially if it's not an income generating asset that would appear on a tax return or something like that that would be more accessible to the estate. But going back to your current users, have you had any uh, customers pass that have engaged your services, and, and what was the experience? Yeah. Actually, uh, I'm going to answer again that question twofold. Okay. One is before we launched the service, and I, I, I really hate to use this term, but we had pilot deaths mm -hmm. where people we knew were going to pass away and uh, we wanted to see what would be the reaction and response by website owners, including the big ones like LinkedIn, Amazon, AOL, uh, Google, uh, Facebook. And uh, the, the responses we got were, were success, 100% success. Since we lost the, launched the program, we've had success with getting what we need achieved, whatever that client's goal was. So, and that again, even including in this case, Apple, uh, we were able to get what we needed done there. So yes, we've had success both in the pilot so that we knew when we launched this business, this was gonna work. And then now that we have clients enrolled, uh, again, we're only a few years old, so we haven't had the the volumes of death that would come with decades, but the ones that have passed uh, where we've done the estate, we've had success. I, I, I can't say anything short of that. That's great. So let's step back for a second and walk through the timeline of how you work with, with your clients, your customers, and, and some of these, um, some of the custodians. We talked before about um, how some online services might not be able to pick up on a death, especially if a phone is reused and, and, and an account is logged into after a decedent's passing. Um, how does DCS prove or, or what evidence do you look for to actually confirm the death of one of your clients? Well, because we're in most cases today, we are a provision in the estate documents. We partner with the estate when we carry out the, the directives. So we're going to get the death certificate. We're going to get the letter of testamentary or authority. Uh, we're going to get a statement from the trustee or the executor as well. Uh, we'll get the obituary and we'll we compile a package that we send to the custodian and we include everything that they they have as requirements and plus even more uh, so that we can get the the directives carried out. Uh, that's how we carry out our directives. We do not activate on a brother calling up and saying, my brother passed away. We have to verify that this person was authorized to work with us. Uh, we want to see their, the proof from the court or the trust that they are a representative for the decedents, the state or trust. So we're not going to just begin our services on hearsay or rumor mail. And that's going to take... A little bit of time to get that started then yeah it takes a little bit of time uh, we've got it down streamlined so it's actually fairly easy I think the biggest 
issue is really getting to the court on, an, on a will and getting the executor signed, and that's out of our hands. And then you're probably, in a lot of instances, working with a personal representative, and an executor, an administrator, or maybe a trustee who has never heard of you before, and you have to partner with this individual to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. Can you describe how that process usually, there's probably a lot of surprise on the other end uh, of and a, a, a steep learning curve for that person. I, I, I can't help but chuckle because we not, they not only get surprised that we exist, but then they're even more shocked about the work that they would have to otherwise do that we're actually able to handle. So there's a sense of relief, um, particularly in a situation where the death was either sudden or potentially unexpected, um, that they don't have to run around and do all of this. So it's actually more of a sense of relief and wow, I don't have to deal with this. I never thought, it's, it's so common for us to hear, I never thought about this before. Or wow, that's a lot of work. Uh, and by taking that burden off the estate, they really get a sense of, wow, this, this is a product and a service or handles very sensitive matter and is a valuable service. Um, and so we, we find that um, they're actually a little bit more pleased that we're around. And to those in the planning side, they feel relief, they get peace of mind that everything that they've worked for, many times their entire lives is now protected. They feel a sense like, okay, in today's day and age, it's not just sim uh, simply enough to do a will or a trust, but I've got to make sure everything gets passed on. If I'm going to guess what the answer is going to be here, but if somebody calls you out of the blue and says, my spouse, brother, parent, child has passed away, and they haven't used your service, is there anything that you can do to help that fiduciary um, with, the, with the administration process? Absolutely. Um, while we are a technology, we, we are always available to walk people through the process, help them understand the process, uh, try to get them a little bit more information of what they're going to experience because technology is not perfect. As much as it's optimized, it doesn't mean it's perfect. And we want to make this as painful, pain, yeah, as painless as possible for them. So we want to work with them. Uh, but our service, because it's fairly automated for them, it's actually very easy for them to figure out. The biggest issues that we've seen are, do I want to close that bank account right away or do I need to leave it open? Well, with our service, we don't have to send out information right away. They can dictate when they want information sent out. So they have control. They cannot change the directive, but they can control the timing of information. So how do you handle clients who have cryptocurrency? So we currently have a visibility solution today where we can make sure that the crypto is visible or the exchange is visible. We do not hold the encryption key. Uh, we recommend that you, you put that into a safe deposit box or someplace safe. Uh, we've heard horror stories where $10, 20000000 million is, is locked up and never to be found, and, and the IRS is in some cases still saying, you owe us money on that. Uh, but we are developing a solution that will have multiple tiers of uh, security measures in place so that uh, the, the, the account holder can feel very confident that they can leave behind the crypto, whether it's currency or assets, and there's contingencies behind that. So it's not a one use solution, but rather there's backup methods to it. And I don't want to go into much more of that because it's proprietary, but uh, we will have a, a full service crypto solution available shortly. And when you say full service, do you, does that have uh, an aspect of, of holding private keys as a part of a component of it? I don't want to get into that at, at this time. Well, maybe we'll have to have you back yes. in a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Some, from some of the conversations we were having before we started recording, you certainly do have a plethora of great stories and great anecdotes about the state administrations that have gone wrong. So maybe when we have you back, we'll have to go into 
uh, just a great tales of everything yeah. that can possibly go wrong in a state administration process. The I'm worst sure, of. You know, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, the worst of. It's, it's like great bedtime stories. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Send everyone, to keep you up at night. Exactly. With great <laughs> nightmares. So um, I, have, I have one more question for you. Let's look to the future. Um, use your crystal ball. Tell me what you think this world looks like 10 years from now. How, how have things oh. changed? You know, has has artificial intelligence taken over in terms of the administration process? Um, is is are all the the major custodians on board, and have they have they unified in their approach, or is it going to take even longer to, for this to play out, where this is not such a burden to fiduciaries? I think, based on the just the generational demands, we're going to see a dynamic change. You're going to see. Uh, younger people looking to mobile technology to create wills, states, provisions, directives. Uh, you're going to see probably website owners creating account holder death options. Uh, but I would say it'll be on the most basic of levels. Uh, and I see really, most importantly, a streamlining and a consolidation of services. And I think that's really where we need to be going so that uh, whether you're a legal or wealth advisor, you're not dealing with five or six different vendors providing different aspects of handling a person's planning and administration, but rather treating it really more as a big business where you're going into one stop and they're being able to do form creation, intake forms, digital asset management, uh, advanced directives, um, and, and who knows what the future may hold. But I think you're going to see uh, this become, from a service provider's point of view, uh, more of a commodity and service that's streamlined and designed to be efficient so that lawyers and, and wealth managers can focus in on the client and get them the right advice and not be caught in the mechanics of it. What do you think the biggest barrier to entry in terms of having that more streamlined process is right now? I think currently, um, death death has been dominated by lawyers up until recently, and rightfully so. Um, everything's been on a small community and local level, you know, from the individual to waiting for their mail to arrive. Um, municipality has different regulation and so I think uh, the service providers have had to be very localized and very fragmented but now with the digital world really bringing having no geographic boundaries you're starting to see it being treated more like a business and with the the influence now of website owners and app manufacturers, uh, and they're thinking on global scales, we're going, I think it's been in a kind of a clash of taking something that is old, traditional, and local, and marrying it to something that's fast-paced, dynamic, on a, on a worldwide level, and trying to get them to work together. And I think that's been one of the biggest problems but at the same time, innovation is coming along. Organizations like DCS are starting to implement technology that recognizes the local need, but services also the, the big enterprise need as well. And DCS um, has the capability of servicing international clients, not just US-based clients? Or? Uh, correct. Um, and I think that's one of the, one of the questions that we talked about before we, we got on air. Um, we in the U.S. have it generally very easy. Uh, overseas or even north in Canada, if you're a resident of Toronto and you have a Gmail account, not only do you have to get a court order from your home country about, about the decedent's passing, you actually have to comply with California's version of are you FEDA? because the company is based in California, they have to comply to California law. So now just imagine trying to get Canadian advisors and clients to think about US law. 
And if you think about it, that's the way the world is going because, again, the the internet and online community is, is not, they, they don't see geographic boundaries. I mean, some do, but generally account ownership can be anywhere. Oh, and uh, for the record, for our listeners, I am in the Rufada camp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, oh, one final question for me, Lee. How can our listeners find you and get more information about DCS? Sure. Uh, you can find us at www directive communications with an s dot com uh, that'll bring you right there or you can reach us at 1-800-372-8121 again 1-800-372-8121 or you can write us at info at directive communications dot com uh, again, our guest today was Lee Poskanzer, the CEO of Directive Communication Systems. Lee, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming to the studio today. We really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you, and I enjoy talking with you and talking about digital property. It's truly an important aspect of our lives. Many thanks, Lee, and we hope to have you on again soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Digital Planning Podcast, the podcast designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating or review at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.